Okay, so here we are actually going to try to take the ball from the basic theory that we've applied and bring it to completion where it does the bounces, it moves forward, it comes to a rolling stop, all of that. Basically, what we had planned out here. In the last video, we looked at just some basics of the ball moving up and down, um, but now we're actually going to look at how we can apply sort of physics and gravity, animate a sense of physics and gravity to the ball. Um, and be able to start bringing it through to completion. So this video, we're going to actually do the animation uh, without the principle of squash and stretch. And in the next video, we're going to add on to what we create here and then carry it through with squash and stretch. So I've just opened up the ball file again right from the beginning. And uh, what I'm going to do is uh, pop on over into my side view. All right. And um, I'll make sure that I put this into a uh, shaded view. So I just press 5 on the keyboard there. Okay, so what I like to do before I do anything is to just, again, because it's a brand new uh, file, I just opened it up. I always go in, check my animation settings, just the things that I always do at the beginning. So right now it's set to weighted tangents. Um, I'm going to make sure that I turn uh, clamped and stepped on as my uh, tangent types because I had changed that in the last video, so I need to change it back. Um, everything else looks fine. And um, let's see, I'm also going to go in and uh, normally I would uh, try to create a, a project directory for this, but because this is such a simple animation, I could probably just save out the file. But this is my uh, default rig file, so I don't want to be saving over that. Um, you know, I want to make sure that I'm saving this as a separate file. And so I'm going to go to Save Scene uh, as Save Scene as because I'm going to read. I'm going to change the name of it, and um, I'm going to go to the option box as well. All right. So um, all these options are fine, and I'll just say Save Scene as. And now I'm just going to, I'll find a place where I could, uh, where I could save this. From now, I might just throw it on, on the desktop, for instance. Um, and we'll call this our bouncing ball, right? And you could number it 01, or you could say start, or something like that. Just some way to get an indication of where you're at. But I'm also going to go through and make sure that I turn on incremental saves so that um, Maya automatically will increment each save that I have. So I'll just say save scene as. And again, I'll go to the file save scene options and make sure that incremental save is on. That way, every time I press control S to save, it will uh, save out the current version and save out the new version um, and make sure that they um, get, uh, we don't actually end up losing any of our saves, right? So in case we ever have to work our way backwards. All right. So. Um, I also like to kind of have a floor for myself. I don't necessarily like working with the grid too much. I find the grid to be just kind of ugly, but I do like to have a floor. So I'm going to create a basic floor by going to create polygon primitives and we'll do it with a, not a plane because a plane is just really thin, but I'll do it with a cube. All right, so we get a little cube here, with the W key to go into move mode. Um, and now I'm just going to hit the R key to go into my scale tool and I'm going to start start scaling this out um, pretty wide right something like that just so that I can actually see that there is a bit of a, a floor here that I can work from right it doesn't need to be very thick but just something like that and this way if I come up here to uh, where my grid display options is if I turn that off now I have um, you know a really easy floor to see and I'm not dependent on the grid anymore to kind of help me with that all right, another thing that I need to do before I um, start animating is decide on what is the frame size that I'm working from. Because I need to make sure that the animation fits within that frame size and that also the ball is not so small that I can't really see what's going on. Um, so what I'm going to do is come into my render settings, which I can access by clicking on this little clapboard with the gear icon next to it. And I'm going to look at down here, um, I have image size options. So I'm going to just change this to a custom value. And I'm going to make this basically um, HD proportion, 16 by 9 aspect ratio, but just at a smaller size. So we'll say 720 by 405. All right, so that's the same thing as uh, you know, the, the 1080p or um, 720p aspect ratio, just 
smaller pixels. Okay, so having done that, now I want to be able to actually see what that looks like in the viewport here. So I'm going to come up to this little icon that looks like a rectangle with a blue sphere in it and press that. And this is my resolution gate. And what I'm seeing right now in this uh, lighter area is the 720 by 405 resolution. Right. So I can see that my um, floor is wide enough to fill that whole area. And um, when I go to render this out now, anything outside of this area is not going to be rendered. It's only the stuff that's inside this lighter area. So this might be a reasonable um, resolution to work from, a, a reasonable distance from camera rather. Remember in the previous video that I mentioned uh, that we're not going to really be uh, animating this character control uh, because that's just going to, we're just going to place it somewhere, maybe like over here at the start and just leave it where it is. The only thing we're really going to animate is this control, main control. Uh, so I don't want to accidentally end up selecting my uh, cube or my floor, which I could actually go in. I could just click on this name up here and just type in floor instead. Right. Um, I will put that onto a separate layer. Right. And so these, like these display layers that we see over here, uh, we can create our own ones as well. So with that selected, I could go and say layers, create layer from selected. And now, with that little visibility icon, you can see I can turn that on or off, right? I'm going to leave it on, uh, but I'm going to come over to this blank icon here and click on it a couple times. The first one is T, which is called Template View. Uh, it's where you can't select it, and it's sort of wireframe displayed. If you click on it again, you get to R, which is called Reference View, which is same thing. You can't click on it, but it is now in Shaded View. And then you could just turn it off so it is selectable. So I'm going to leave it on R, and I'll just double click on the layer name, and we'll call this um, something like floor. If I try, try to give it the same name as an object in the scene, uh, it will give me an error because it says that name already exists. So we'll just call it, I don't know, floor layer, something like that. And we need to have an underscore between all of our names in Maya. We can't use spaces. Uh, it will give us an error if we try to use a space. All right. so floor layer. There we go. Awesome. So the first thing I'm going to do now is I just hit control save or control S rather to save. All right. So if we go back to our reference, uh, we're going to be starting up high and then coming to a bounce and then another bounce and then another bounce and progressively getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So let's try planning that out. Let's figure out where we want to start from. Maybe just uh, moving this guy somewhere right about here, just so that it's coming in sort of halfway off the screen to begin with. Now, um, I'm arbitrarily choosing a height here, but to me that probably looks pretty good, both in terms of uh, the amount of energy that it's going to have to release, and then also just in terms of where it sits sort of aesthetically on the screen. I don't have um, my auto key on, so what I want to do is uh, just hit the S key to set my keyframe. Um, right now, I am at 24 frames, and, and uh, at most I'm going to have 100 frames in this animation. But right now, I'm only going to be putting these uh, frames down side by side, so I probably won't have more than 24 individual little um, keyframes at this stage. All right, so that's our first one there. Then our next one is going to be on the floor. Now, how do I know how far to make this jump? Well. There's no, there's no uh, science to it, aside from the fact that if you make it jump too far, then it's going to have so much forward momentum that it's never going to come to a stop in this scene. So you got to think about that as you, as you animate this. How far can I go so that it's probably going to come to a stop within the scene? Uh, you know, so maybe somewhere about there. And I want to make sure that every time it comes down onto this floor, that it's always coming down to the same value, which I actually know should be. Um, a, a y value of zero, right? So, so long as the y value is zero, the translate z value can be um, anything, um, but the y value just needs to be zero. So I'll press uh, S there as well. So now I have my first two frames, right? So my next frame is going to be where the ball is back up in the air, but at the next apex. So again, how far do I want to have this move? Well, 
It's probably, if you think about it, the ball is kind of moving at the same rate forward, but gradually losing speed. So it means that um, each of these distances, especially toward the beginning, are going to be pretty similar uh, in the forward, forward direction. Right, so if I look at, and this can be where turning on the grid can be of some use if you wanted to use it to help you count, right? So if I say, all right, so that that was uh, right on the edge there, and then that was one, two, three, four, five, six-ish uh, forward there, and then you know, one, two, three, four, five, six is right there, maybe just slightly less than that, somewhere around there. That can be useful in terms of the grid. But I kind of turn it off again because I don't like looking at it. All right, so now I'm going to bring this up as well and try to figure out what's a good height. Now this can be where turning on that um, onion skinning or that those um, what did we call it here? For, onion skinning is a is an old term for this, but um, we call it ghosting. All right, so we're turning on the ghosting can be useful. Now what you'll notice is is that I moved this forward, but I didn't put down the keyframe. I didn't actually key it. And that's why I lost that position. So one, two, three, four, five, six, right there, ish, somewhere like that. Okay, and then bring it up, and then just hit S to key it in. All right. All right. So that's probably down a little bit too low if I compare those. All right. That might be okay. Maybe that's probably fine. It depends on, you know, when we think about um, what's the right height for this, we have to think about the materiality of the ball. If it's a ping pong ball, then with each bounce, it's going to lose a minimal amount of height because ping pong balls are really super bouncy. If it's a bowling ball, with each bounce, it's going to lose a lot of height, right? It'll be, um, the first bounce is going to be uh, really much, much less than it was uh, after the initial throw, right, and it tapers off very quickly. A basketball is, you know, it's fairly bouncy, but it's definitely not a ping pong ball. It's a lot heavier. All right, so I've keyed that in. Now, I like to make sure that I go in and I always press S to key things in. But when you're starting out, sometimes that can be a really good idea, so you don't accidentally create keys, but it can also be a problem if you forget to press S because it hasn't become a habit yet. So it can be okay to go ahead and press this icon right here, which is to turn on auto key, which means that whenever you make a change, um, it's automatically keyed in. But you just got to remember that as well. So if you accidentally move something around, you're going to lose whatever key was on that frame. So you always have to make sure to advance to the next frame before you start moving again. Okay. So the, uh, the next frame, again, as I said, we're just continuing to move forward more or less the same amount. All right, so um, we're going to come forward maybe one, two, three, four, five-ish frames maybe now. Somewhere around that, somewhere in that area. And this is going to be back down on the ground, right? I could easily just probably type in the value here as zero since I know what it's going to be. All right, so if I look at my animation so far, I'm starting to obviously approximate a bouncing ball here, which is good. All right, so cool. Now let's see, one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. I'm just putting my finger on the screen right now, though you can't probably see that. So basically just a little bit less than that now. And up. All right, so compare this to where it was before and then where it was here. So one, three, five. Okay, that's probably probably doing okay in terms of the old comparison. Now just for the sake of benefit, for the sake of helping you to visualize what's going on here, I'm going to go in and uh, unreference the geo so I can select the ball. All right, and I'm going to come in and go up into the animation tool menu. I'm going to go to visualize and ghost selected. And I'm just going to say, um, we'll do custom frame steps. And we'll say, uh, we'll do all the steps before. So something like this, 10 before and 0 afterwards. 
right? So that we can better see what's going on here. So we can actually see, you know, what is the what is the gradual trail off here? And ultimately, um, as we mentioned in the planning video, there is this sort of um, trailing off that happens where the ball needs to uh, kind of approach a limit uh, where it's where it eventually gets down here. But if I look at this right now, if I start paying attention to this over time, it feels like it's not going to end up getting uh, to the end of my screen before and start rolling before um, it gets off the screen. So I might be actually up a little bit too high. So bearing that in mind, I think what I'm going to do is start to bring, uh, not select the ball, but select that, and bring this down a bit here on frame 5. Go back to frame 3 and do the same thing. It might be worthwhile actually going in and uh, going back to that ghosting. So visualize, go selected, and I'm going to say before and after. So 10 before and 10 after. There we go. Just so I can better see this. And then again, make sure I'm not doing it on the ball, but selecting the animation control itself and just bringing that up a bit. Right? Okay. Ignore the fact that it kind of leaves behind something there. There we go. This way, this is kind of like looking at it, um, if I were drawing it out on paper, I could see each one of these balls in relationship to each other uh, on paper. All right. Okay, so, cool. So now, um, I'll leave that on for now, the ghosting, and uh, we'll go to the next frame, which is going to be maybe just only about four um, of these uh, grid marks ahead. One, two, three, four, something like that. All right. And um, I'll bring that down to zero. So just hit translate Y of zero. There we go. That might, that doesn't quite appear. I think maybe I'm one off. Bring it ahead one more. There we go. Yeah, it's a little bit better there. Okay. Um, and so next frame, one, two, three, four-ish. Something like that. And then a lot lower again. And next one, one, two, three, four, just slightly less than four this time, as it slows down a bit. Okay, and uh, type that in as zero. And I'm still probably going to be coming up against this uh, wall. I might need to pull back a little bit with my camera, but I'm just trying to minimize the amount that I need to pull back by. So I'm just going to pull back now just a little bit. That's probably a bit better. Okay, so nine, one, two, three, maybe, and just a lot less small bounces now. In fact, even with a with a bounce this small, it might not even be three. But um, just reduce it a bit. Yeah, I'm thinking that that might actually be too wide there, because ultimately, what you got to keep in mind is that um, as we end up with a each bounce being lower, then the distance between them is automatically going to be a lot less as well. So you can see here that there's actually an issue between the amount of spacing um, on, on this ball here, uh, between here and here, and then it's a lot less here and here. So I should probably bring this one back a little bit, actually, to be honest. Let's go back and find that one. This is the, the advantage of looking at this with the ghosted view. It's because you can actually really see how everything is related to each other. And in doing so, I say, all right, well, that comes back there. But then all these other guys should come back as well. So I might move them all back a bit. Trying to keep everything kind of proportionally related to each other. So sometimes it's it's not about being so mathematical as it is more about just saying what looks right, you know? This looks better to me, just in general, if I just think about how the motion should play out. All right, and then there might be a one little tiny bounce that's left here, but it's 
I'm not going to be very far away from this guy now. Right? And it's, you know, this is like a one frame bounce or something. Relatively small. Right? And that's probably the last bounce. And then the rest of it is just going to be, you know, rolling to a stop somewhere. So I'm just going to let that continue to roll and just say maybe it stops about there, right at the edge of that, um, at, right at the edge of my floor. Okay. Okay, so this is my blocking, right? And as you'll see here, I don't even know if this is the same number of bounces. I didn't actually count. I probably should have. Uh, I got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven in a roll. So yeah, one, two, three, four, five, six. It's maybe a little bit less, but that's okay. Um, you know, it's it depends on on what we're what space we have available to us proportionately and what we can see well, but we'll try to factor in the same timing as much as possible if it makes sense. Um, all right, so I'm going to save that. Now, um, sometimes I like to save things as like this is my blocking stage, and I might want to go in and save it as such. So I might say save scene as, and call it uh, bouncing ball underscore blocking. And I usually put it in caps so it's easier for me to read later. All right, so um, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to start doing my, my cleanup um, where I can go in and take this out of the blocking step and start to play around with uh, the both the timing and the spacing. So let's just um, go ahead and now save this as, we're going to save this as, as another name now, save this as... Um, We'll call this uh, maybe, in this case, we're just going to call it cleanup. Later on, uh, we're going to go through a, a really specific process of animation where we go through blocking, linear, spline, cleanup steps, um, but we're not going to get into all those steps yet. So we'll just say save as. All right, so with that done, now let's go in and take a look at our keyframes themselves. If I click on my on my ball here, we'll see that we have all my keyframes down here. Um, but what I want to do is probably get rid of this ghosted view for now. So I'm going to go back up to visualize, and we'll say um, unghost all. Now, um, I'm going to go in and start moving things around to match my timing that I have more or less uh, tried to figure out here in my planning. So I want the first bounce to occur at frame 13. All right, and I want the last one to kind of roll off here. So what I'm going to do is this. Knowing that the first bounce is going to be at frame 13, here I have frame 1, and this needs to be frame 13. It means I need to shift frame 2 all the way down to frame 13, but I already have a frame 13. So I actually kind of want to shift all of these down. In the previous video I showed you that you could uh, shift click on a frame and then drag and move it. But that's not going to work for us here because we need to move a bunch of frames. So another option is to make sure you have your object selected, hold down shift and while holding down shift, drag a selection around a bunch of frames. Now you can actually move the whole series. Right? So that way I could shift all of them down a certain amount and that'll work as well. But generally when I do this kind of thing I tend to do it in the graph editor. So um, first off, what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up my timeline to be 100 frames long, because now it makes sense to do so. And I'm going to go into my graph editor. So that's Windows, Animation Editors, Graph Editor. All right. So if I look at this now, if I just look at Translate, Y, and Z, which are the two um, that are actually our, uh, our, our animations. Um, what I see here in Translate Y is our up and down. You see the balls bouncing up, down, up, down, up, down. And Translate Z is our forward momentum, which is kind of just gradually sort of uh, staggering off there. So uh, what I want to do is go in and grab both of these, just Translate Y and Z, and start to take each of these keys and shift them down. Now, I think it probably will be a little bit easier for you to see what's going on if I do this where I have a view, a staggered view, um, of 
let's try it this way. We'll put our um, layouts two panes stacked, and the bottom one is going to be our uh, graph editor. There we go. And just selecting translate Y and Z so we don't see anything else. And I'll put this guy up there, and I'll move this down just a little bit. All right. So here's the thing with the um, with the graph editor. If you click the F key. Um, if you had your graph editor uh, sort of in a weird kind of configuration and you hit F, it's going to frame everything up to fit the current view of it. If you need to squash, if you need to sort of pull back, it's the same kind of controls that you would use in the regular viewport. So Alt, left mouse, sorry, Alt, uh, right mouse button is going to be sort of pulling back and forward, right? Alt, middle mouse button is going to allow you to move back and forth. And if you hold down Alt and Shift and right mouse button and drag left right, you'll be able to proportionally scale in that direction. And then if you hold Alt Shift and up down with the right mouse button, you will go up and down like this, which is quite useful. Okay, so what I'm going to do is come back here to frame two, and I want to drag everything from frame two onwards down. I'm going to grab all of those keys. And what I'm going to do is make sure I hit the W key to be in move mode. And what I'm going to do in here is um, go in and hold down my middle mouse button and shift so that they stay um, without, so they don't end up being arbitrarily moved up or down. And just sort of drag this down to frame 13. That way I can see that all those keys now are on frame 13, or they should be. But What's happened though is that there are all these other keys that were left behind, all right? Because uh, we didn't select them all. So let's go ahead and make sure that we we do that. Uh, so I just undid a couple times. I go back to uh, Control Main, and we can see that we have all of our keys now. And I'll just make a selection around frame two there. Hold down Shift, middle mouse button drag, and put it on frame. 13, match it up there. Okay, so now we can see in our timeline that all of our keys have moved down. And this is really up to you to decide what works best for you. Uh, if you prefer doing it in the timeline, great. If you prefer doing it in the graph editor, great. That's really up to you. All right, so I suggested in our planning that the next bounce would be at frame 33. All right, so let's grab everything else from the next frame downwards bring this down to frame 33 which is way down here hold down shift middle mouse click and drag there we go and then our next bounce will be grab everybody else I suggested that oh you know what I did sorry I thought that looked a bit off uh -huh. I'm gonna undo apologies there we go. The next um, bounce was at frame 33, but the next key that I have in here that I just uh, arbitrarily avoided paying attention to is actually where it's up in the air. So that's halfway between. So if I think about it, 13 to 33, that's 10 frames. So that means that up here at the apex, it's actually frame 23. And then the next one's at frame 33. Paying attention, I recommend it. It's a good idea. Otherwise, you do stupid things like I just did. There we go. That goes to frame 23. Next one, like I said before, goes to frame 33. That looks a lot better in the graph editor. I was a little bit worried there for a second, thinking my timing was way off. All right, so the next one, 33 to 48, that's a difference of 15 frames. So the middle of that, approximately seven. So we'll say we'll bring that out to frame 40, and then maybe the next one is frame 47, somewhere in that range. Um, so, bring you out to frame 40, next one goes to frame 47, and then um, there's about a 10 frame dif difference between here, or 9 or 10 frame difference, so let's just say um, bring this out by 5 or so, so put that out to uh, frame, 50, frame 52. And the next one will bring out to frame 57. 
Okay. And then finally, um, you know, maybe only a five frame difference here. So it brings out a few frames, maybe frame uh, three or so. So 58 at the all right, currently at 57 there, so I'll put this out to maybe 61. Oops, didn't deselect my other one. Frame 60, that looks okay. And there we go. And then this next one is probably only going to be about, you know, one f couple frames or so. So one. Something like that. Yeah, that looks better. And then it just tapers off. And this one here, um, you know, if we look at what's happening here, we have our final bounce, and then it just rolls for a while. So this is actually just going to take a while to come to a stop, and I don't really know how long it's going to be, so I'm just going to arbitrarily sort of put it out to maybe frame 80 or so. Okay. So what we have now is we've timed everything out. And you can see it along the timeline here that um, as we move through, things are getting gradually closer and closer together at some kind of proportion. And um, if we were to go up here now and, and press play, let's put this sort of where it should start. And we'll just keep it there for now. Um, and press play. All right, we're getting a sense of this ball moving along. All right. So I can press save now. And um, if you're playing this through and it looks like it's playing back too fast, then what you want to do is right click on your timeline and make sure that you set your playback speed to real time. By default, it might be on play every frame free. And if it's like that, what you'll get is a result that looks like this, right? Super fast. Right, so you need to make sure it's on playback speed real time. Okay, so that's all well and good, but it's kind of a little, it's a little bit difficult to tell exactly whether or not it's working well just by watching the blocking. I think it's a little bit fast, I think it, um, in the forward momentum, but we'll see. We can always play around with that later, we can tweak it. So what I want to do now is come up and um, let's go in and start editing the graph editor, kind of like what we did in the previous uh, tutorial. So if I come back down here to my graph editor, and I'm going to sort of start to um, minimize this a little bit here so we can kind of better see what's going on in the graph editor as I do this. I'm going to just go to my translate Y for now because I only am going to concern myself at the moment with my ups and downs. So I know, for instance, that all of my bounces are going to be uh, require a linear tangent type. It's going to be what's called a fast in and fast out type of uh, movement or, or spacing. And all of my uh, apices, all the tops of the curves, are going to be where the ball slows down and is a little bit more graceful. It creates a parabola or an arc. And that's going to require a flat tangent type. And this is exactly what we did in the previous lesson. I'm going to hit F here to help frame this up a little bit better so I can better see the ups and downs of each of my bounces. And I'm going to go ahead and start out by grabbing just all of the apices, all the keyframes associated with just the apices. And hold down Control and Shift to add other uh, keyframes there that weren't previously selected. All right. So with just those ones selected, I'm going to come in, and here is my flat tangents icon. I'm going to turn those into flat tangents. Now the um, outs on these, as you can see, the um, we have this sort of weird thing happening, uh, and this has to do with the clamped and stepped nature of these keys here. So if I go in and grab just the bottom keys and try not to select at all, any of my apices and set these to um, linear, we'll get that looking correct. Okay, so this is kind of like what we see. This is just our default, right? We get um, the flatter tangent types at the top, 
right, where it slows down, more graceful, eventually comes to a stop, and then it starts to pick up speed again. And in here it's going in faster because it's becoming more vertical, and then it comes out fast, slows down, comes in fast, out fast, slows down, right? Um, and this is just a default. This is what we get just by default in Maya when we make those changes. And let's look at the animation now to see what um, how, what this appears like. All right, so we're getting a weird um, result. Now, what we're seeing here is correct based on the changes that we made. But remember, we only made changes to the Y or the up and down um, part of our animation. What we haven't done is uh, gone in and done anything to our um, uh, our forward momentum, which our translate Z, which is still in the stamped, uh, st uh, clamped and stepped mode. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to grab all these guys. I, I clicked on translate Z over here. I'm going to grab all of those controls, and I'm going to change this to linear tangents. All right. Now let's see what happens when we try this. All right, so now we're getting somewhere. Okay, so we can start, even though the bounces look really pretty terrible at the moment, they're of course a lot better than they were just in the clamped and stepped mode, but we can we can also start now trying to evaluate whether or not our timing seems to be working well. And it's okay for a while, but toward the end, toward right about now, especially that last bounce or so, it, um, really seems to slow down super fast. It's like it slams on the brakes. And it's important that we don't uh, create something that looks like it's slamming on the brakes. So what I might do here is um, I'm just gonna, uh, I'm actually gonna go in and grab my floor. I'm gonna turn off the um, reference there. And I'm gonna move this over a little bit. I'm cheating here. I'm just gonna move this over a little bit. So I have, a, have, I have more floor to play with. Um, and when this guy comes to a stop, right, stops right there, currently on frame 80. Well, what I'm going to do is say, let's actually make this frame um, something more over here. Like it continues traveling farther. And I'm also going to grab that, hold down shift, and grab this and pull it out. Maybe, I'm just going to pull it way out to 100 and see if that even looks right. So I'm playing around with my timing a little bit here. Let's just see what we get when we do that. Okay. Um, I can probably believe that a bit more. Now, it's not really slowing down there at the end too much, but I can fix that later on in the um, graph editor. But I believe that more because it doesn't feel like it's actually slamming on the brakes. That's my technical term for, for what I was seeing, is slamming on the brakes. Graph editor. And select my object again, translate Y, and we're just going to start cleaning up our ups and downs first, and then we'll go in and clean up that forward momentum. So hit F to uh, frame this up a little bit nicer. Okay, where do I want to start? Mm, well, I'm going to start on my first bounce, which is this frame right here. And with all of these, all of these bounces, I'm going to need to make sure that I do the same thing. First thing is I'm going to go in and um, break the tangents so that I can independently move either side of these, which is what I demonstrated in the previous video. Now they're all broken. Cool. That's a really important thing. Um, and I want to be able to, um, you know, move each one of these uh, separately, which is why I break that. Now here's the thing, and I just want to point this out. I've gone through and made sure that at the beginning, and I pointed this out at the start of this video, that I had uh, in my animation settings turned on weighted tangents. But let's say that you didn't, you forgot. And what would that look like? Well, what a weighted tangent is, is it allows you to be able to um, go in and actually edit the magnitude or the or the velocity and, and the, uh, of the how the uh, curve moves into a keyframe like that. Now, what does that, this is what a weighted tangent looks like, so what does a non-weighted tangent look like? Well, I've got this one selected, and we're going to go in my graph editor, I'll go to uh, Curves, Non-Weighted Tangents, 
Now I guess something that looks a little bit different has these little, um, and this is a, kind of an update in Maya 2017. It looks slightly different in other uh, versions of Maya, but kind of the same, similar. But notice how I can, I'm, I'm trying to click and drag on the tangent handle and it won't let me stretch it out, right? I can't change um, the, the spacing into the keyframe. So if that's the situation for you, all you need to do is, is grab all of your um, keyframes like this and go to weighted tangents. In fact, it looks like, it looks like in fact, that um, it changed it for all of them. So I'm just going to say weighted tangents. And it, you don't even need to select them anymore. This is a little, a little bit different. But I think you used to have to select them all. Uh, but now you can just either toggle between weighted and non-weighted. Cool. So what you want to see is this. Now, with all that being said, let's go in and start to uh, play around with the um, the incoming and outgoing natures of these curves. And I'm, I know for sure that I need it to be a lot faster in and faster out than it was. Right, so I can arbitrarily start making that curve look a lot more like what I had here in my planning. All right, which includes also maybe stretching this out as well a little bit, trying to keep it nice and flat, right? And coming in and grabbing this one. So what I'm going to do now is that I've done this, um, I want to just kind of watch what my result is, because now I can actually see it over time. This is just the first bounce or so, right? Notice how that first bounce feels a lot better than the, re than the ones that follow it. But there are some things I need to pay attention to in this bounce. First off, um, let's go back and p turn on our um, visualize ghost selected. Now, I want to point something out here. Notice how I keep going back and using specific tools, and I have to go into the file menu to, to go and find them. Well, I can put them on a, uh, create an icon for them on a shelf and then be able to just click on that icon each time I want to use them. So here's how I would do that, because that's going to make my life a lot happier. Um, in your shelves, you'll see a tab that says custom. And it probably is empty at the moment, because you haven't created any custom uh, shelves yet. Now, I'm going to go back to visualize. And I'm going to highlight ghost selected. But before I click on it, I'm going to hold down Control and Shift. And um, I'm going to also, instead of just clicking on uh, Ghost Selected, I'm going to make sure to click on the option box so that whenever I click on this icon, it's going to actually open up the options as well. So Control Shift click, and it will drop it in there uh, as this colorful icon, which is uh, that, that's a particular icon that uh, Autodesk has associated with this feature. And I also um, frequently use Unghost All, so Control Shift and click on that. All right, so now I have those two. And if you um, look down at the, at the bottom of your screen, right down here, you'll see when I hover over that, it tells me uh, what those icons do. And also the same thing if I hover over the icons themselves, you get a little menu that pops up underneath it. So I'm going to choose Create Ghost Options. And um, we'll just leave the same frame steps that we had before. Ah, but remember, here's the thing. You know what I did? I forgot to click on the actual sphere itself. It's got to be on the ball. Ghost, there we go. All right, so as this comes down now, you can say, all right, yep, we're starting to get good spacing there, right? It's continually getting bigger and, and bigger. And then the thing that I really want to focus on in this is to make sure that the resulting bounce that comes out of there um, is not higher. So basically, if I'm looking at just this ball here and this ball here, that the one on the left, which is where it was coming into the bounce, is higher than the one on the right. Now that one on the right at the moment could possibly stand to be a bit taller. Just thinking that this seems like it's losing quite a bit of energy. So what I'm doing now is I'm kind of interactively playing around with it here in, um, the, in, in the graph editor to, to create the result that I want. I'm also kind of looking at, at this. The distance between this frame and this frame is uh, it's 13 to 23, so that's 10 frames, and that's 23 to 33. It just seems like this might be a little bit, 
might be a, an issue there. I'm going to step this back. Does that look better? No. Okay. I'm just arguing in my own head here, so ignore me if that's confusing. But I'm going to stretch this out here a little bit. The reason why, something just kind of is throwing me here a little bit, where it seems like the distance between here and here is greater than the distance between here and here for some reason, but maybe it's just an illusion. Um, now, let's, uh, let's watch what that looks like over time. So I, I don't just play my animation back, I like to scrub it back so that I can really see what's going on over time. Okay. Now, also, because this bounce should be more or less equal in terms of the amount of energy throughout um, one side and the other, then I would expect that whatever I'm seeing on this side, right here, that distance there, should be the same as what I'm seeing on this side. And it's nice if there would be a little bit more distance on, on this side, kind of like what I'm seeing here between these two. So let's play around with that a little bit more. There we go. That's looking better. That's looking more similar. All right. And again, if we, um, I'm just going to turn off um, on Ghost All and watch that. Now, that really seems to hang in the air for a little while. So I might go back in a moment and, uh, and, and tweak that. But uh, let's go in and I'm going to focus on just tweaking up some of these other ones. And I'm arbitrarily just kind of going in and uh, adjusting my bounces here. I'm not saying that I even am doing this correctly. It's just I know what they have to kind of look like in general. Um, so this was, again, control shift and right mouse click up and down. That way I can just kind of zoom in vertically. This is just like one frame, so it probably doesn't matter what shape they actually have. Ultimately, though, this should be higher than this. So bring that down. Probably wasn't able to really tell before, but now because I'm so far zoomed in, I can. Okay, so having done that, let's watch. What do we get? Certainly the bounces feel better. Um, there's one right there. So bounce, bounce, and this one right here feels like it's really fast. It's, it feels like it's picked up momentum um, in the forward direction. So if we pay attention to that, when we get to this uh, bounce here, starting at frame 33, hopefully you can see this in the playback. Right? It just feels like it's picked up speed. Now let's figure out why. Is it an issue in Translate Y? Mm, let's see, frame 33, that's this one here? Probably not. So, And since it's a forward momentum issue, it might just be something in uh, Translate Z. So let's look at this. All right, so there is a little bit of a of an issue here where um, there's some unevenness in the spacing. But here's you know when I'm when I'm approaching my translate Z here, my assumption is that overall the ball is starting out at a particular speed and gradually losing speed with distance, and especially when it starts to roll on the ground because there's more friction. So what I would expect is that this is actually pretty straight, or it should be pretty straight. I'm going to cheat. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to say, hmm, let's just pretend that it's pretty straight from here all the way to here. And how do I do that? Well, I could adjust each one of these, or I could just go in and say, delete. Now what do I get when I watch? Better. Okay. Much better feels more natural. There's a lot, there's less variation. Now there's the one thing that still remains, which is um, here at the end where it still is just, it's just kind of continuing forward and uh, without coming to a real stop. And there's a reason for that. If I look at this graph, this is all linear, right? So this just continues moving forward. It never comes to a stop because in order to come to a stop, remember, the graph has to become horizontal. So how do I deal with this? Well, this ultimately should be flat. So if I click that and flatten it out, now I'm going to get something that's a little bit smoother. 
And this right here now could probably stand to be, um, it is linear, but let's just go in and I'm going to um, not flatten this. If I flatten it, I'm going to get this result, which is where it becomes horizontal. I'm going to change it to a different type. I'm going to change it to what's called a spline tangent, this one right here. And it's just going to help to interpolate better between this tangent type and this tangent type. Now let's see what we get when we try that. All right, cool. So we're coming to a nice stop there. It feels natural. It feels much more natural than it was at the very least. All right, cool. Happy with that. So, you know, I could stop here and say, bam, I've got it. Or what I could do is make sure I go in and really evaluate each one of those bounces to, to ensure that it's exactly the way it needs to be. And that's, of course, what I'm going to do. All right, so click on my object, go back here. I'm pretty happy with, um, with translate Z, I think, so I probably don't need to really evaluate that anymore. But translate Y, all right, let's, uh, our, our way to do that is going to be through our ghosting. So uh, I'm going to go back up, select my ball, turn on ghost selected. Now, I'm just scrubbing through my animation here to really give it a good evaluation, making sure that each of these bounces looks the same. Um, more or less, that uh, each of the balls coming back out uh, is uh, this. The one on the right is not as high as the one on the left, so it's losing energy. Okay, it's looking pretty good. This one could, this ball right here could stand to be just a little bit higher, a little bit more spacing. How do I know that? Well, you know, I'm being really pedantic here, but you can see that there's a little bit more space between the top of this band and the bottom of the ball there than there is here just indicates to me that um, I can play around with the graph here and translate Y a little bit more. All right, so pull that up a bit. And uh, sometimes I, I really do like to just go in and make sure that um, I, I like to have the balls just kind of hang in the air a little bit more. All right, this one here kind of looks funny in the graph. So, so that, because it looks funny in the graph doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be funny in when it plays back, but it can be an indication to pay attention. So uh, this is, that's fine there. Cool. So this one here, right, this is where it looks funny. Uh, it looks, you know, if you look at it right here, it does really flatten out. We kind of lose an arc which may mean that this could just possibly stand to be pulled up a little bit more. All right? There we go. It's probably going to look better. And again, checking the ins and the outs there. Um, that's probably okay, though I might be able to pull that up just a little bit more. There we go. And then coming back in, making sure that they're similar. Good. Again, it's probably flattening this out again a little bit more. So I'll pull that up just a tiny bit more. Which means that this guy here can probably pull up a little bit more too, just to stay proportional. All right, coming into this bounce here. All right, so if I look at this bounce that I'm, I'm popping through here, notice how, if you kind of look in the graph, sorry, not the graph editor, if you look in um, the viewport, that doesn't really feel too much like an arc. It's more like a linear kind of just straight line. So, you know, I can play around with this here to, to um, improve some of that, that arc. This happens so fast, maybe you'll never notice it. But, you know, it's best practices as well. So why not? It's not hard to fix. This one here takes place over like one frame, <laughs> one or two frames. Uh, so it's really fast, um, but all the same. Always give, you know, if you got the time, give your animation the love it deserves. Cool. Now, let's play that back and see what we get now that we've uh, we fixed things. And I'm going to unghost everything. Cool. And press play. Cool. All right, so that's working out quite well. It might still be a little fast on the forward momentum. Um, 
which means and it's not a difficult thing to fix, but I'll, I'll play around with it for just one moment. Let's just save my file as it is. Um, if I come in here, select the ball, and take my translate Z, the forward momentum is determined by the amount of verticality in the graph of translate Z. So if I reduce the amount of verticality there, if I just grab those guys and I sort of pull it up a little bit, maybe, and also maybe pull this back a little bit so that um, this just sort of tapers off sooner. Something like that. Pull this back. What do we get then? And this is just a small adjustment, but it's a you know it's a worthy adjustment. You see that you can, can become really particular about things here. Ah, I like that a lot more now. Just a small adjustment there, but you can see that it really changes the overall feeling and that the ball does actually feel like it's coming to a stop more naturally. Cool. Um, so, and that's in 100 frames. That's exactly, that's the upper frame limit here. So, um, in order to, um, you know, sort of save this out, what would I do? Well, um, that's the corner edge where the ball's going to finish there. And where does it start? Okay, it's going to pull back a little bit more. Ball starts right about there and ends right at the edge of that floor. There, I think that's going to be good. Ah, it ends a little bit earlier than that now. It's okay that there. I'll grab my floor and move it back a little bit just so that it looks nice for the presentation. There we go. So I get really particular with this sort of thing. Um, save. Now, uh, so what the ball doesn't have right now is any rotation or squash and stretch, right? So this is kind of like the first step. This is where you, you go through and you've, you've created the basic uh, movement of the ball. Now in the next tutorial, I'm gonna take you through how to um, clean up the, the ball uh, so that it's got more rotation and squash and stretch. Now, actually I recorded that tutorial um, about a year ago. So it was a previous version of Maya, Maya 2016, but all of the um, essentials are still the same. It's the same ball. It's more or less the same animation. It's not exactly the same one as I have here because I just made this one and that one I made a year ago. But for given sakes and purposes, it will be the same. You can apply the same knowledge to it. Um, and one thing I do want to point out here, though, is just how, how to create a play blast uh, so that you can save out your animation without having to render it. So the play blast is just a quick way to get something out of Maya. And to do that, you'll come in and um, have your timeline set to the range that you want it to play back from and go to right click on your timeline and play blast options and it will open up this this is your play blast um, view now here are the things that you want to make sure are enabled you'll go into um, format will be not AVI but QT for QuickTime I'm going to save these out as an MOV file QuickTime file. The encoding um, can just be MPEG-4 is probably fine, but um, I usually use H.264 if I can. Quality, I leave it at 100. We don't need to compress it. They're small files. Display size, I'm going to use from render settings. That's the 720 by 405 that I set. Scale, set it to 1. If I set it to 0.5 by default, it takes 720 and divides it by 2 and it takes 405 and divides it by 2. I just want it to be the exact setting size that I had. And I'm going to save it to a file. All right, so we'll just call this uh, cleanup. All right, so that way it actually gets saved as a file. And now I'll click Play Blast. And what it will do is it will go through and it will render out my scene. And it will save it out and uh, presumably open it up as a video here. Um, at least it usually does. Let's just see, I might have to open up as a video, so let me go and grab that real quick. All right, so it saved it, it tells me where it saved it down here, which is my uh, my current directory, which is from the previous project, which is my little UFO project, and it saves it into the movies folder, and right there. 
Um, previous versions of Windows seem to open this up without hesitation, but um, I might have to open it up myself. So if I open it up with QuickTime or VLC or whichever, um, I'll get my little playback play here of what was in um, Maya. Now, um, sometimes when you open up things uh, for the first time in QuickTime, it takes ages. So to avoid that, I'm just going to try opening up in VLC. There we go. Um, and that's playing back. Now here's the thing that you see is that I'm actually seeing the um, screen resolution or sorry everything outside of my resolution gate so before I create the play blast I want to turn that off. So I'm going to close that and um, I'm going to go back here and turn that off. All right and uh, you it might no longer look appropriate on your screen depending on what your screen's resolution is but it will render correctly. So play blast, it'll keep the same settings as before, and it'll go through and render this out now, and you'll see that there's no longer any um, resolution gate issues. And go back here, and uh, open with VLC. There we go, that's looking a lot better. So you just wanna make sure that when you render this out that the ball's not so far away that you can't see it or anything like that. Um, I also recommend just two other things. First off, I recommend that you turn off any of the animation controls, their visibility. So to do that, um, come up to in the viewport where it says show and turn off NURBS curves. Later on, I'll explain to you what NURBS means, but turn that off and they disappear. And if you want a slightly higher quality preview, you could go to uh, render and we're in viewport 2.0 right now. If you're in viewport 2.0, click on the option box. And I'm just going to, in here, uh, scroll down to where it says anti-aliasing. Smooth wireframe and multi-sample anti-aliasing. And what that does, if you notice uh, on the ball, is that it just gets rid of the jagged edges. Right? So on some computers, depending on the scene, it might slow things down a little bit. But in this scene, it's so simple that it won't. So we'll just play blast that again. And we'll have a much nicer result this time. And play blasts are really good because um, sometimes when you're playing things back in Maya, you will find that uh, you know the the maximum frame rate that Maya can support is not real time, whereas creating the play blast means that it will definitely play back in real time. So there we go. That's our animation. Um, and uh, in the next video, I'll take you through how to add the rotations and the squash and stretch. So see you then.